56. I didn't even plan that. Psalm 56. Psalm 56. By the way, you kids that are in here, you ought to listen up today and behave because someone was very good and remembered how much we like these, all right? So you kids listen up, and I might get you have some of these, and I won't keep them all for myself, all right? Psalm chapter number 56, and I'll ask you to stand with me. We'll read a couple of verses together, and we'll jump right into this thing. Psalm 56. Psalm 56. You know what you learn the longer you live? Uh, no one cares about your tears, typically, humanly speaking, as much as you do. But outside of that, the Lord cares. And your tears matter to the Lord. Uh, your tears have a lot to say about you. Actually, we're going to look at that. Psalm 56. And uh, as I read what David says here, I'm reminded of how good we have it with the God that we have. You understand your God is not just some impersonal force in the universe. He's a person. And look at Psalm 56 in verse number 1. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up. For they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are evil against me, are, are, all, are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. So they escape by iniquity. In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Look at verse 8. I want you to pay attention to this. When I cry unto thee, shall, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. I'm sorry, uh, 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 that's verse 9, verse 8. <laughs> thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle, are they not in thy book? And there in verse 9, he says he cries unto God and God is for him. I want you to notice there that God has a place where your tears go. David says, put thou my tears into thy bottle. And I want to talk about your tears and why they matter to God. Father, this morning I pray you to bless the message. Lord, I pray that you would accomplish exactly what you see fit to accomplish, Lord. There may be some folks that have been shedding some tears over some things in their lives lately. You need to hear this message, Lord. I pray that you'd minister to them. Or there might be some Christians who haven't shed a tear in years. And it would be a good thing for them to learn how to do it again. Lord, I pray that you would uh, speak to us as only you can for your words. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated if you would. You know from reading your Bible that the Lord says in Genesis chapter number 1, let us make man in our image. You remember that? And uh, over there in Genesis chapter number 5, you learn that after the fall and after sin, that when Adam has a son and he names him Seth, that Seth is born in the likeness and in the image of Adam and not of God. However, when God cre created man originally, he was made in the likeness and the image of God. And so what you learn is this. What you are is you are a fallen version of the likeness and the image of God because of sin. But you know what you learn when you read it with the Bible? You learn that God is a person and he has emotions. You understand that? The Bible says that God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. <gasps> God is angry. Yes, God experiences and God demonstrates anger. How about this? How about hatred? The Bible says of the Lord, these six things that the Lord hate, a seven, are an abomination to Him. God is an emotional God. Understand, folks, emotions are, in and of themselves are not bad. God put them inside of us. It's when emotions get ahead of us, and they lead us, and they make our decisions for us, and they control the destiny of our lives, that we find ourselves in trouble. But understand, you're an emotional creature because the one that made you is emotional. In Zephaniah, God says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will joy over thee with singing. Psalm chapter 2 says that the Lord laughs. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. You say, what about humor? Does God have a sense of humor? Yes, he does. You say, what's the scripture for that? Well, he made you, didn't he? Amen. <laughs> I mean, there you go. God has a sense of humor. Hey, God has love. For God so loved the world. All right? Christ died for the church because he loved her. We understand that God is an emotional being, and we ourselves 
our emotional beings as well. When someone says to me, Pastor Adrian, I'm just, the reason I don't get excited at church is because I'm just not an emotional person. I think in the back of my mind, let me talk to your kids. Let me talk to your husband. Let me talk to your wife. And I'll find out you get emotional about something. You say, why? Because we're made that way. We're made to be emotional creatures. And in that, you learn that man cries. And he cries a lot. In John chapter 11, shortest verse in your King James Bible, Jesus wept. It showed his capacity to experience the humanity of life and to cry with fellow man. A man once wrote, crying is common in this world. It does little good to ask the reason for it. One might call our planet the weeping planet. Laughter can be heard here and there, but by and large, weeping predominates. With maturity, the sound and reason for crying changes, but it never stops. All infants do it everywhere, even in public. Amen, those of you that have little ones? <laughs> you know, I remember my, my older sisters, they still hold this against me. My, my parents took us to see Bambi in the theater in Germany when I was like two or three. And I don't know if it was a shotgun blast or something, but I started crying. <laughs> and my parents had to take us out of the theater for that. And to this day, they're like, you ruined Bambi. <laughs> By adulthood, most crying is done alone and in the dark. Weeping for babies is a sign of health and evidence that they're alive. Isn't that something? That weeping is a sign of life. Not laughter, but tears are life's sign. It leaves weeping and being existing as synonyms. First mention of tears in the Bible is Hagar crying and weeping over her son. Esau cried over his blessing in Genesis 27. Jacob, I love this. Look at Genesis chapter number 29. Genesis 29. Genesis chapter number 29. And you can read into this what you want. But in Genesis chapter number 29, I want you to look at verse number 9. While he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother. Now, stop real quick. Rachel becomes his wife, does, he, does she not? When Jacob meets his future wife, what happens here? Look at verse 11. Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Now, you could read into that a lot of different things, okay? But you know what you find all through the Bible? You find it all in the book of Genesis? Man cries. Jacob, the same man, cries over his lost son, Joseph. He weeps over Joseph. Joseph, eight times upon meeting his brethren, and, and, and before he, dis, he shows them his disguise, and even after which time he reveals himself to them, eight times he cries over the encounters he has with his brethren. From the beginning of the book of Genesis all the way, and you know you learn there, in the beginning of life there's crying. Crying all the way through. Have you shed some tears recently? Probably have. Say, why? Because it's human to do so. And the first thing I want to say this morning is tears in your life get God's attention. Not only in Genesis, but for the next 64, 65 books in your Bible, you read about man crying. Hey, can I say this? All the way through, even when Christ comes back, you would think the whole world would be happy and excited. All the nations shall mourn. They're going to wail for him, the Bible says. Weeping all the way through. Tears in your life get God's attention. Look at Isaiah chapter 38. You say, why? Because weeping can bring healing. Isaiah chapter number 38, and if you're familiar with Isaiah 38, my favorite verse in the Bible is Isaiah 38, 17. Love that verse. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Love that verse. You know what the context of that verse is? We're about to read it. Look at Isaiah 38 and verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. I mean, can you imagine waking up on a Sunday morning and coming to church? And, you know, you're, you know, I woke up this morning feeling fine. I woke up with heaven on my mind. Get your King James Bible. You're excited to be here. Everything's great. Preacher gets in your face and says, You're going to die today. Set your house in order. And if you don't listen to your father, that may happen. Amen? All right. little illustration there on the side. 
But imagine, <laughs> imagine that happens. The prophet gets in your face and he says, today's your day. That would be pretty sobering. I mean, because the track record of the Old Testament prophets is spot on. And so when the Lord reveals something to them, and the Lord says, thus saith the Lord, and they repeat that message, it happens. Hezekiah wakes up like every other morning. And the prophet gets in his face and says, set your house in order, you're going to die. What did he do? Look at verse 2. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. You know, there are some things in your life that nobody else can help you with. I watch Christians all the time struggle with this. They try to find, now look, church is a blessing. We need each other. There's camaraderie. There's fellowship. There's protection in numbers. But there are certain things that even other Christians can't help you with. You're going to go through those things alone. And then the man of God brought the message to the king. And King Hezekiah hears the message from, uh, from Amos the prophet. And without batting an eye, you know what he does? He just turns this way. And there's nobody that can help him. All he's doing is looking at a blank wall. He looks at that wall and there's tears coming down his face. You know, you, you learn about those tears in a little bit. And he cries before his God and he confesses his sins. And he says, God, are you sure? God, would you be merciful? God, I know it's my fault. Now listen, there's some things you don't read in the passage. But later on, like I said in verse 17, my favorite verse in the Bible, Hezekiah attributes the fact that God heals him in this instance. And he attributes that with God casting his sins behind his back. While I may not be able to prove it, I believe in the context of Scripture, it could be stated that maybe there were some things in his life that weren't right, and God says, okay, that's it. You say, why? Because all the kings around Hezekiah, they were wicked kings, and here comes one who has a heart for God, and he lets some things slip. And God says, okay, that's it. And Hezekiah gets alone with the God, and he cries his heart out to the Lord. And I want you to read here in verse number 3. It says, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. You ever cried so much that you just, the tears don't even come anymore? You're just basically sobbing. You ever cried so hard you just almost just pass out from crying? And you've tried everything else you know to try. And you turn to the wall, and you get alone with God, and you just weep. Look at verse 5. And the Lord's word comes to Isaiah, and it says this in verse 5. Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. God heard the cry of Hezekiah no differently than how he did with the children of Israel in Egypt. You know what he says about them? Behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come to me. I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. See, there's a, if you're not careful as a child of God, you know what you'll do? You'll say, no one cares. God doesn't care. Does he see that I'm crying? He sees it. And he hears it. And he's collecting those tears and he's putting them in a bottle. And there are times in your life where you have nowhere else to look and you've tried this person, you've tried that relationship, and you've tried this, and you've tried education, and you've tried career, and you've tried all the things that you thought would bring happiness and that would fix the problem, and nothing else fixed it until you go alone with God and you weep your heart out. There are some Christians who haven't gotten over things from 5, 10, 15 years ago. You say, why? They need a good crying session with God. And that might be you this morning. Hey, listen, I know in a room like this, I'm talking to some people who could do waterworks in 30 seconds or less. And in the same room, I'm talking to some people who haven't cried in 10 years. Some of you that haven't cried in 10 years, you need to ask God to break your heart. And say, Lord, I haven't cried over, over my sin in years. Lord, I haven't cried over a lost soul in years. Lord, I haven't cried over the needs of someone else in years. Lord, would you break my heart? Can I say this? He knows how to do it. Sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. That quote is from Psalm 51. You know what's going on in Psalm 51? David has pretty much ruined his life. He took another man's wife and he had that man murdered. Look at Psalm chapter 51. Go there with me if you would. Psalm 51. I read a story about a missionary in Zaire. 
Dr. Helen Rosevere. And she told a story that there was a mom, an African mom, that was at the mission station and she was giving birth to a premature baby. And in giving birth to that baby, again, a lot of the, the things that we take for granted at the hospitals that we have just around here within 5, 10 miles, they didn't have there. And even as a doctor, she didn't have all the resources that you'd have in a first world country. And she did what she could, but the mom passed away giving birth to that premature baby. And that baby, if it was in America, would be on life support. That baby was barely alive when it came out. And they were desperately seeking for a hot water bottle, just something to make some kind of makeshift incubator. There was a lot of tears shed that day. They get all the kids together, and all the kids are sobbing, and one little girl sobbing lifts up her eyes to heaven and says, Lord, would you please send a hot water bottle today? Tomorrow will be too late because by then the baby will be dead. And dear Lord, could you send a doll for the baby's sister so she won't be lonely without her mommy? That afternoon, a large package arrived from England. The children watched eagerly as they opened it. Much to their surprise, under some clothing, they found a hot water bottle. And that little girl says, If God saw our tears and listened to my prayer, I bet you there's a doll in there too. Amen. Sure enough, she starts digging. Five months before that thing took place, a bunch of ladies in a church in England sent that package over. God saw the tears before they fell. There is trouble coming for some of you in your lives in different ways. It might be sickness. It might be people. It might be financial, whatever it may be. And it's going to come your way. And God knows it's coming before it happens. And he's sending the preparation if you're willing to send a t shed a tear. Psalm chapter 51. Psalm 51. David speaks here. And he says here in verse number 4. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Look at verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse uh, 9. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Don't you know there were some tears being shed in Psalm 51? You can read about in 2 Samuel 12 where David gets over. He hears about that baby, that, uh, his baby that's about to die, and he knows it's attributed with his sin. And David is there and he's weeping before God and everybody watches David and they see him weeping and fasting and then the baby does pass away. And no one has the courage to go tell David and when he sees that they're whispering, he goes, is the baby dead? And they say yes. David goes and washes up and he comes back and he praises God and he, he eats some food and they go, what is this? This man was crying before God when the baby was alive and now he's acting like everything's okay. David had been able to pour his heart out before God, which is why he could get up and wash himself when he knew there was nothing else that could be done on his side. But until he knew that, there were some tears that were shed. You want to get God's attention in your life? Some of you need some healing from your sins. Some of you need healing from your past. Some of you need healing from some of the consequences of choices that you've made in your life. Some of you might need healing from your lack of fellowship with Jesus Christ. You need to learn to shed a tear. Let me say this. Look at Mark chapter 9. Tears bring increased faith. You want to get God's attention and increase your faith? Learn to cry. Look at Mark chapter number 9. Mark chapter number 9. I think one of the most beautiful sounds, I can think of some beautiful sounds in the world. A mom speaking to her baby. You know. And that baby that, man, now I'm not going to lie to you, at two in the morning, that, wow, that ain't beautiful. <laughs> All right? All right? You know, maybe for some of your moms, oh, it was such, yeah, I get, when you get, when your kids are older, you romanticize the baby years. Right? Am I, am I serious about that? Am I right about that? You go, oh, I remember when they were a baby. Yeah. And you couldn't even brush your teeth with, ah, you know. And, but uh, one of the most beautiful sounds of mom dealing with that baby. I think one of the most beautiful sounds I hear is just what I just heard right now. Flipping the Bible. 
to find another place in Scripture. Look at Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And look at verse number 14. When he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I, I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answereth him, and saith, O faithless generation, how shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Notice that what the Lord points out is faithlessness here. Look at verse 20. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foamy. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. Now let me ask you a question. Is this not God manifest in the flesh? Doesn't the Lord know how long this boy's been dealing with this? Why did he ask the father that question? Get him to look back and think about it. And you know what happens after that? Look at verse 22. And oft times you have cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. The Lord says unto him, Thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believeth. I want you to see verse 24. Straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. You ever prayed like that to the Lord? And you're praying, you're wrestling with God over something. You say, Lord, I need help with this. Lord, I can't do this. I even took him to church. I took him to these people. I did this and I tried this and I, I don't know what else to do. Lord, uh, sometimes it's a parent feeling like they're failing in an area of their life as a, as a dad or as a mom, or it's your marriage, or, or it's your fellowship with the Lord. I don't know what else to do. I can't break this addiction, this habit that I have, this demon, this thing that just keeps following me. Lord, I need to be healed from it. Lord, I need your help. And the Lord says, do you believe? And you say, Lord, I know you're right. I know the answers. I know what the book says, but help my unbelief. The tears just streaming down his face. I wonder if the Lord asked him, how long he's been dealing with this just to get the man to think and to be able to cry to God for his son. You see what happened? Well, I can tell you this. Can you imagine, imagine family reunions with that father and son from there on out? Can you imagine a picnic where all the family gets together? And they're talking about the childhood, and they're talking about this. And all of a sudden, I guarantee you, those tears start to come in Dad's eyes. I remember the lunatic my son was. I remember the mess that he was until I met Jesus. Amen. Amen. Probably wasn't the last time he cried over it, but those would be tears of joy going forward. Remember when Peter's walking on the water, the Bible says when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, O oh, thou heavenly Father, which doth create, which hast created the heavens and the earth, thou that dost inhabit. You know, he didn't say any, he did not pontificate. He simply says, Lord, save me. <laughs> and the Lord did. Amen. Tears bring healing. They bring increased faith. Let me say this. They bring God's commendation. You know, there are some people that will come around you when you're crying, some families, your spouse, your children, and when they see the tears come down, they're there to console you and they love you. And we're thankful for that. But isn't it something when God does it? Isn't it something when everybody says, ah, oh, we're, we're sorry you're going through this, we love you, we're praying for you. But isn't it a blessing when God sees your tears and the Lord says, you know what, I like what I see. Look at Mark chapter 14. You're in the book. Mark chapter 14, just a few chapters over to the right. Mark chapter 14. Look at verse 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, and you learn from Luke 7 that he was also a Pharisee, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. 
And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. Look at verse 8. She hath done what she could. Now you may not know it from Mark chapter number 14, but you read Luke chapter 7, and the Bible says that she stood behind him at his feet weeping. You say, why would a woman do that? Maybe because she found a man who didn't love her for the wrong reason for the first time in her life. Maybe because she goes, I can't believe that he's letting me touch his feet. And the things that I've done in my life, and the places I've gone, the things that I've touched, and the things that I've seen, he let me touch him. You want to get God's attention? Learn to shed some tears. Tears express value. Tears show what you care about. You may have heard of a guy named Will Rogers. He was known for his laughter and for making people laugh, but I read a story about him, how he went to the Milton Berry Institute in Los Angeles. It's a hospital, at least back in the 20s, that specialized in rehabilitating polio victims and people with broken backs and other extreme physical handicaps. And Will Rogers was an entertainer. He, is, he had humor in all his presentations, and he, he had real qui uh, quippy things that he would say and get people to laugh. And he had the place just laughing and having a great time. Even those that were in severe pain, they were laughing, they were enjoying it. And in the middle of his thing, he goes, excuse me, I'll be right back. And in the middle of the joke, they're all clapping. He goes to the bathroom, and Milton Berry, the, the man who the hospital was named after, follows him in the bathroom to see if he needed a towel or anything because it was hot that day. And he goes in there, and he just sees the man putting his hands on the sink, and he's just weeping and bawling his eyes out, looking at all the people and all their sickness. He said, what was it? He was touched with their infirmities. As a man, you know what Jesus Christ is? He is touched as a high priest with the feeling of your infirmities. And you know what the tears of God, and you know what the tears of man express? Value. They say, if you can show me who a man's friends are, what a man laughs about, and what a man cries over, I'll tell you who that man is. It expresses what you love. Look at John chapter number 11. John chapter number 11. Tears get God's attention. Tears express value. And in John chapter number 11, you read about Jesus Christ going to the tomb of Lazarus. Guys, I'm sorry, but when I think about the God that we have, and one that cares about our problems, cares about your broken hearts and cares about your problems and cares about your health and cares about your children going astray and cares about your spouse and cares about your bills and cares about the things that no one else even cares about. We serve a great God. Amen. The one that created the universe experiences manhood and he lives a perfect life and he resists his temptation. And when he's around man, he comes down, he stoops to his level, not by sinning, but by experiencing his humanity. And in John chapter 11, the Bible says here, in verse 33, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And the Bible says Jesus wept. And then said the Jews, behold, how he loved him. And I think about the fact that the Lord weeps. And he's touched with our infirmities and he's touched with our problems and our humanity. And there the Bible says that they attributed his crying 
with the fact that Jesus loved Lazarus. So I'm going to ask you, Christian, this morning, when's the last time you cried over your Savior? You love him? Does it break your heart when they mock his name? Does it break your heart? Does it cause you to weep when you hear what they say about your God? Does it break your heart to see your fellow brethren going through some of the things that they're going through? And instead of living in a vacuum and living in a bubble, you seeing their problems, can you, as the Bible says, rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep? The longer I live, the more it amazes me, the callousness of man to man. How bitter people can be to each other. And how hateful they can be. I'm glad I have a God as an example. Amen. The Bible says, No man can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I'm convinced that some Christians will cry over a Hollywood movie that has no bearing on their life whatsoever. People acting out a scene, they'll cry over a TV show. They exhaust all their emotion. It's not that there's not emotion. It's that they've already spent it all. And they come to church and they read the Bible and there's just nothing there. You say, why? Because you've invested it in this world. You've got emotion. You've shed some tears. But when's the last time you shed one for him? It expresses what you love. Look at Revelation chapter 5. It expresses what you need. Crying is one of the greatest ways to point out to your God and a fellow man what it is that you need. In Revelation chapter 5, you want to know what the inspiration for this entire message was? It was this passage of Scripture. And I was reading through my Bible this last week, and one of the most exciting times in my years when finish through the Bible and start back over in Genesis. And I, I remember Brother Allen challenging us in Sunday school when I was 13, 14, 15 years old. And uh, his way was a little non-conventional. He would ask us, you've been reading your Bible? I'm like, well, not like I should. You're a knucklehead, he would say. You, know? <laughs> you need to read your Bible, he would say. And I remember that, finished through and this last week. But I was reading Revelation chapter 5. And in verse number 1, it says, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Christian, you better thank God that this is not a hidden book to you. This is not sealed to you. If you're a child of God, you can read this and the Holy Spirit of God can interpret for you. And you can be ministered to because of what you read in this book. And here, John, it's a very climactic moment because the Bible says that he was brought up to heaven to write the things down that he saw. And the Bible says in, in chapter 5, they're looking. There's nobody in heaven. They're searching. They're looking. Is someone worthy? Is there anybody that's worthy to open the book? And these folks say, well, I, 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 I'd love to try, but I was a sinner. And I looked at things I shouldn't have seen, and I touched things I shouldn't have touched, and I went places I shouldn't have gone. And, and, and those other beings would say, well, listen, I, I wasn't that. The, the cherubs and the angels would say, I didn't do those things, but I never was tested. And all of a sudden, from the very corner of heaven, you'd hear, worthy is the Lamb. And down the Lamb would walk, and the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was the only one that was worthy. But I want you to see in verse 4, it says that I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. You know what you need desperately? You need God's words. You need the word of God in your life. When's the last time you cried and said, Lord, I want to understand this. I want to know this because I know if I know this and I understand this, I'll know you and I'll understand you. God, would you help me? When's the last time, listen, we cry over things and they're not all illegitimate things. There are some great reasons, some good reasons to cry. But when's the last time you cried over something that you wanted from God from His Word? 
You know what Job says? I have esteemed his words more than my necessary food. Your tears express your need this morning. Christian, when's the last time you cried? When's the last time you said, Lord, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. And you just poured out before the Lord, Lord, if I can't get the sense that you're going to help me, and Lord, if I don't get the sense that you're with me on this, and Lord, if I don't get the sense that I'm going to uh, get your, pl- your, your, your will accomplished in my life, Lord, I don't want to get up from this place. When's the last time you were that sincere? And tears came down your face. You know what you'll do? You'll do the same thing that I've done before. You'll say, man, I'm really seeking God's will. And you'll ask 50 people to pray about something that you're not praying about. And you'll say, you know what? I'm really struggling with this thing and I really want to get through this. And you'll talk to other men about it. Can I say this? You have one high priest and his name is Jesus Christ. And there's an offering that only he can bring that no other person, including your pastor, could do. And when you talk to a fellow man, yes, they should weep with you, and yes, they should pray for you and pray with you, but there's nothing like pouring your heart out before God and saying, Lord, I need you. I need truth from your word. I want to talk to those of you that are involved in ministry. If you're not careful, the ministry will just become about people. It'll just be lateral. It'll just go this way. It'll just be about, I got this duty, I've got this responsibility, I've got to be here at this time, and it's a bunch of checks uh, off of a list, instead of saying, God, I want to weep, Lord, I want to rejoice in you, Lord, I want to have emotion in you, Lord, I want to be zealous for you. I know many pastors and pastors' families and pastors' wives and missionaries and missionaries' wives who become burnt out because years ago they spent their emotion on just the duties and responsibilities of ministry rather than loving their Savior. From Genesis to Revelation, man is weeping. Your tears express your value. Your tears get God's attention. But can I say this? If you're saved this morning, your tears are only temporary. Paul the Apostle says, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of Jews. Acts 20, 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. 2 Corinthians 2, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears. You know what the ministry is filled with? You know what life is filled with? Tears. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. You say, why is life that way? Why is even the Christian life that way? Can I remind you that our Savior was despised and rejected of men? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Life is a veil of tears. But can I say this? It eventually is going to come to an end. And Christian, there's coming a day when you'll have no more tears. I want you to consider a man being born and experiencing the trials of life and debt and sickness and disappointments and betrayal and children breaking his heart and then finding one day the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that man gets saved and he's gloriously saved. But then 10 years later he's diagnosed with cancer and he loses his health and many tears are still shed. You understand even after salvation there are tears that are going to be shed. On the flip side, I want you to remember that there was a rich man that lived fair and sumptuously every day of his life. He had a good life. He probably shed some tears here and there, probably not as much as a poor man, but he shed some tears, and the man dies and he goes to hell. And you know what that man does for eternity? That man weeps, and he wails, and he gnashes his teeth, and he's never getting out. You say, why do they cry? I think that part of the reason why a soul cries in hell is because he knows he's never getting out. 
I think the reason why a soul cries in hell is because he remembers his life and he remembers the opportunities to have received the gospel, the opportunities to have followed his conscience towards God. He remembers the times when someone put a track in his hand. He remembers or she remembers the time that, that they came to church and heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and said, no thanks, I'll do it my own way. I don't need that. I'm good enough on my own. And that man will burn forever and ever. And that man cries for himself and he cries for his memory and he cries for his family knowing that they're going and headed to the same place place and you know what that man is doing right now that man's crying look at revelation chapter 21 boy i'm thankful for this i am so thankful for this i can't wait to wake up one day in a place where there's no sin and I look at my hands and the hands that used to be sinners' hands, look at them and they're glorified and they're clean and they're pure. And every time I think something, it's about Jesus Christ. Amen. And everywhere I look, everybody's healthy and there's nobody that's crying and there's nobody that's depressed and there's nobody that's anxious. And, and, and you know what, I've, been to the, I've seen these rock concerts where someone comes out on the stage and everybody cries for that person and they're just, man, look at it, there he is, you know, Steve Smith, Aerosmith, oh, I, if I could just touch him. I mean, that's nothing compared to heaven and glory and Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God coming down. Everyone's going to go, there he is, and everybody's going to run to him and just fall on their knees and say, worthy is the Lamb for all eternity. No sickness, no pain, no more crying. Isn't that going to be a good day? You say, why do you get excited? Because that's real, man. <laughs> what happens on CSI or what happens on, you know, the Dolphins play the Bills or the Broncos play the Cow? No, who cares about that stuff? That's not going to matter in eternity. Revelation 21. You know what you are if you're saved? You're a child of God. You, the moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, He adopted you into His family. And man, you shed some tears, some selfish, some not so selfish, some over your own problems, some over the problems of others, uh, some over your own issues, some over your need and desire for God. And I got news for you, that tears don't stop immediately when you get to heaven. You say, why? Because we still have the judgment seat of Christ. Knowing the terror of the Lord, therefore we persuade men. You have the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, where there will be men and women who reject the rulership of Jesus Christ and go out into the lake of fire. There'll be the great white throne judgment where every sinner will stand before God and try to plead his case, and yet God will be found righteous and say, I paid your sins for you. You have to pay for them now because you rejected my son, Jesus Christ. There's going to be some tears there. I don't know, but I have a feeling that even some of us might cry at the, ju at the great white throne judgment considering some of the people that we knew in this life and didn't tell. Considering some of the people that we tried to reach for Jesus Christ and we tried and we tried, but they're in the hardness of their heart, they rejected Him anyways. And it's not until that there's a new heaven and a new earth that you read what you read in Revelation 21. Look at verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. I, I wonder what it's going to be like to see those nail-pierced hands. And he's going to take them. He's going to say, don't, don't cry anymore. It's good. You ran your race. You're home. Amen. I look forward to that day, man. Sure, life is tough. But if you're saved, you know what you have? You have a comforter to help you. Ecclesiastes 4 says, I return and consider all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. Christian, you're going to shed some tears right now. You're going to shed some tears in this life, but there's coming a day when the tears were going to stop. And there'll be no more crying. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more death. Do you understand everything that the socialist, everything that the revolutionist wants in society is in heaven? Amen. Everybody's equal. No one's free health care. Amen. You got a new body. I mean, I could go on and on and on. 
It's there. This lady, Betty Eady, wrote a book called Embraced by the Light. It was a New York Times bestseller. By the way, just because a book becomes a New York Times bestseller means nothing. It means you have a bunch of people that are cloned by the same person to want the same things. And I just watered that down. That's a phrase that means I heard spoken a different way. But this is what she wrote. In November 1973, Edie allegedly died after undergoing hysterectomy and returned five hours later with the secrets of heaven revealed by Jesus. Always be careful of someone who's got secrets from God, but you weren't there to hear them. You got a book that tells you the secrets of God right here. And he says that Jesus, quote unquote, never wanted to do or say anything that would offend me. I think she missed the year of your father, the devil one, and the lust of your father you will do. I think she missed where Jesus calls Herod that old fox. I think she missed where Jesus said to those Pharisees, you're a bunch of whited sepulchers. I think she missed a lot of things that Jesus actually did. And I'm guessing that maybe if she did meet a Jesus, it wasn't the Jesus of the Bible. While she visited heaven, Jesus never offended her. Indeed, Jesus seemed to be, the releg to be relegated to the role of a happy tour guide in heaven and not the Savior of the world who died on the cross. And he cried and he said, Father Abraham, this is the rich man in Luke 16, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. There's tears in hell. A lot of them. You know what the good news is? You don't have to go. If you're here and you've been trusting religion, you've been trusting uh, being spiritual, you've been trusting anybody or anything outside of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary, you can be born again today. You don't have to get baptized. You don't have to join the church. The Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I could swear up and down at the great qualities of this chair and tell you how wonderful the chair is and the fabric and, oh, look at the cushion. That's at least three inches of cushion and it's going to hold you up and it's a wonderful chair. But it doesn't matter until which time I sit down on the chair and I confide in the chair and I trust in the chair that you're going to believe me. You could talk about being spiritual and being religious, but until which time you lean on the grace of God through the person of Jesus Christ and you look at what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary and shedding his blood for your sins, and you understand that there is a payment for sin, and the payment for sin is death, but Jesus already did it for you. When you come to that place and you say, Lord, I understand that, and I'm willing to receive you as my Savior, I'm willing to receive what you did for me on the cross of Calvary for the payment of my sins, I'd rather weep now and rejoice later. He'll take you in. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. If that's you today, I invite you to be saved. Christian, how about you? Have you shed any tears lately? What for? What for? Let's all stand. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I've known.